Welcome to the season two premiere of The Truth is Viral. I'm your host, Bob Powell. You know what the great thing about having your own show is? You can film the open and the bumpers anywhere you want to. As a matter of fact, I think this season I'm going to be out of the studio a lot. Because there ain't nothing in the world like fishing with your boy. Hey, the first thing that I want to do is thank everybody for the condolences, prayers, and, and good vibes that you sent me after my daughter died. And uh, I want to thank my friend Ed, one of my uh, long time viewers, one of my longest time viewers, and a friend of mine for sending me this awesome t-shirt. Thank you, brother. I love it. I'm going to take it hunting with me this fall. But, uh, yeah, I learned something something that I want you to know. We're not guaranteed our next breath. None of us. My 24 year old daughter with as far as I knew a perfectly healthy heart just drops dead of a heart attack. If it can happen to her, it can happen to you. It can happen to me, it can happen to him. Don't waste a single moment. Spend time with your family. Spend time with your loved ones. Make every moment count because you're not guaranteed another. So what are we going to do this year on The Truth is Viral? Well, this first episode we're going to look at the 188 day earthquake cycle. And my first guest to talk about that is Jim Berkland, the USGS scientist that predicted the 7.0 Loma Prieta quake back in 1989, better known as the World Series earthquake. Jim's a fascinating individual. He's got a lot of insight, and I can't wait to, to hear what he's got to say. And in part two, we'll be talking with Terrell Croft. He's also known as Terrell03 on the internet, and Terrell's got a different point of view as to what's causing these earthquakes on what seems to be a regular cycle of 188 days. And last, we're going to find out exactly what it was that I filmed in the skies over northern Michigan just a couple of months ago. It was a mystery for a while, but I figured it out. So while you enjoy this interview with Jim Berkland, me and my son are going to go fishing, see if we can't slay a few bass. Okay, now over the next 40 minutes or so, you are going to see the product of my work. It's not easy putting together a show like this, and it's not cheap either. If you enjoy what you see, then please head over to bobpowell.blogspot.com and drop me a dollar or two. Just click the donate button and send it into my PayPal account and it will help me generate good content for you guys to watch. You know, it costs money just to put gas in the car. This is exactly what I'm talking about. These are the highest gas prices in the nation. How's that for change? I don't have any left. If I'm going to be going out and about and investigating everything myself, I'm going to at least need gas money. Now, I can sleep in the back of the van, that's not a problem. I just need to get where I'm going. And at $4.14 a gallon, it's not going to be easy without your help. So if you can afford to, I know everybody's just like me. They're living hand to mouth, week in to week, and paycheck to paycheck, but if you can afford to throw me a dollar or two, it sure would help. So, uh, thank you. Okay, so Mr. Berkman, there's been a lot of speculation on the internet about there being a 188 day cycle, but uh, you don't subscribe to that, do you? I, 
I believe there certainly is a, a cycle based on the face of the moon. There are equinoctial tides, not only in the seas, but in the solid earth. I've been predicting earthquakes based largely on that since 1974 when I first observed um, a warning that we might have flood tides in the Bay Area due to an unusual astronomical alignment. I was a Santa Clara County geologist at the time and had been greeted in the county by, by six earthquakes in the Bay Area in the fall and uh, early winter of, uh, of 73. And uh, so I made my first prediction because I recognized that the solid Earth was also responding to the gravitational stresses. And uh, so I, that first prediction was for a four to five magnitude quake to occur in the South Bay uh, within one week. And it happened two days later when we got a 4.4 south of San Jose. You forecast an earthquake in a three to four point range this morning. We had an earthquake in a three to four point range this morning. I'm impressed. And I thought this is mighty simple. So I started predicting informally. And I was six out of eight for 1974. It wasn't until 1979 that I added to my repertoire uh, and began to accept that animals were also a method of predicting quakes. Now, do you uh, mean their behavior, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you mean their behavior or by yeah. mass animal die-offs or both? Abnormal animal behavior. Uh, I was very skeptical about such a thing because I believed in black boxes and that uh, the science uh, would be not well served by looking at what animals were doing until I got a call from a physicist from Xerox in... Uh, September of 1979, and he said uh, he agreed with my upcoming seismic window based on tides because the cats were disappearing again. And I almost hung up on him. Uh, I was, he was interrupting my dinner, and I said, what do you mean? Well, I've been studying for the last six months the lost and found column in the Mercury News, and I found that the numbers of missing cats increases before local quakes. And he mentioned several quakes that I well and uh, he gave me the numbers before the quakes and he said just before that Coyote Lake quake of August 7th August 6th of uh, 1979 it was a 5.9 quake the strongest in the South Bay uh, since 1911 and I wasn't paying attention to the animals but I should have because our own cat Rocky had disappeared six days before that quake and I'd never even thought about putting an ad in the paper because cats come and go. But there were, uh, I there was 13 missing cats the week before that quake. And, and um, <laughs> by the way, I'm also writing my latest issue of Syzygy, a monthly newsletter that I started writing in 1990, right after I had predicted and named the World Series earthquake based not only on the maximum tidal force in three years, but also upon record numbers of missing pets. Planets, take, take, hey, well, we have an and strange animal behavior, whales beaching themselves in San Francisco and Santa Cruz, and water levels changing, and booming sounds up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and the change in the temperature and volume of the Gilroy Hot Springs, as it had done before 1906. 1952 and 1979 quakes. Right. Well, you certainly hit a home run with that one. Uh, speculation on the internet regarding this 188-day cycle is that there is a heavy mass object coming into the solar system that's creating a, a trough of, of tidal forces and that every time the Earth comes around the sun and, and gets into a particular alignment that these tidal forces are so great it causes the stress that's built up. Nibiru? Nibiru? That's one name for it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we've had plenty of satellites going out past the sun and shooting pictures back towards the Earth, and we never have uh, seen this other object that uh, must have disturbed the planets and hasn't seemed to. Let me ask you a question. You were talking about booming noises up in the hills. 
Yeah. There's been a lot of that recently, too. There's a town in Wisconsin that, as we speak, is hearing noises and, and experiencing shaking, but nothing's appearing on the USGS uh, seismographs. Well, they don't want to recognize hydrofracturing or fracking. Uh, fracking is a very real phenomenon, and it's causing quakes, mainly small ones, but up to about 4.6. And it's something that I did not recognize. I, I hadn't heard the term fracking until about six months ago. But uh, I'm quite aware of the effect of the changes in poor pressures and from oh, pumping of uh, in and out of wells of gas, and uh, and now they're introducing chemicals, which is uh, increasing great pressures and depth. And that allows the gas to return, or you know, escape. But they are harvesting it. Uh, let me ask you a question about the New Madrid fault or New Madrid. Yes. And uh, that first one in 1812 occurred uh, the day after the new moon. And uh, in reviewing the paper by a professional paper, uh, 494 by a geologist from the U.S. Geological Survey. He wrote 100 years after the three great earthquakes had occurred. And I finally got a copy of that book. And I was surprised to find, about page 35, he has a table of the largest earthquakes, and he said six out of the seven followed closely after the newer full moon. So he had my idea back in 1912. Let me ask your opinion on uh, what's going on down in uh, the Ozarks. Uh, FEMA has been conducting a lot of drills. They've been buying up millions and millions of meals ready to eat and, and moving men and equipment down to the, to the Ozarks area and, and conducting earthquake drills. Do you think that there's a chance that the new Madrid fault might slip anytime soon? Well, there's always a chance. It's normally about every two to four hundred years, and it's been two hundred years. Uh, I'm more concerned about the biggie that's going to hit the northwest uh, on the Cascadia subduction zone. Now, that would cause a tsunami, wouldn't it? Yeah, it certainly would. And then no, without a tsunami potential, but the big quake down in the Mojave in Southern California where they haven't had a big quake, since 1857, and uh, they are well overdue. The strain on the, the, the fault there released um, a strike slip uh, displacement of 30 feet. It went right through an old sheep corral in 1857, and so they know that the dimension was correct. And with the whole two inches a year of Drain on the San Andreas is now equivalent to about a 28 feet of movement. And now the Indian Ocean quake back on the day after Christmas in 2004 was on the day of the full moon. The day of the full moon, and my colleagues tend to ignore that. The last really big quake before then, there was a big tsunami, was the Alaskan quake on March 27, 1964, and that was on the day of the full moon. One would see some sort of a pattern here. How many mega quakes have happened on on a full moon or a new moon? And when I say mega quake, I mean something in in excess of eight point on the Richter scale. Well, there were listed. What was the number I saw? Uh, the USGS had a listing, and it was like oh, 25 of the greatest quakes. Now this was when I was still a county geologist, and I was compiling this list. They had 25 of these superquakes, and uh, 20 of them had been in a seismic window at the time of newer full moon. Now, um, let's see. My my wife was uh, born and raised in uh, New Brunswick, Canada, and she had never felt a quake until she came out here. And I had predicted the, the quake for around the, the full the eclipse of the moon. At, on Thanksgiving Day in 1974, and it hit right on schedule. While I was at the movies with my young daughter watching the movie Earthquake. 
Well, that's ironic, isn't it? Yes, it was. Well, Mr. Berkman, I thank you very much for taking your time to, to speak with us. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to call you back another time because it seems like uh, you've got a lot of information on the topics that my viewers find interesting. Oh, my. Well, global warming is another. <laughs> <laughs> Told you Jim was smart. I've never known anybody with a head for dates and events like that guy. It's totally uncanny. So, yeah, his opinion bears a lot of weight with me. A whole lot more than this guy's. Earthquake warning! I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist. But uh, somewhere in the middle there is Terrell Croft, Terrell 03, as he's known on the internet. And Terrell has a, a bit of a different opinion as to what might be causing these earthquakes than Jim. So, while I continue to fail at fishing, all you have to do to see Terrell's interview is just click on the link at the bottom of this video. Keep your fingers crossed for me, because I'm seeing them jump.